Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, uh, respected chairperson. Uh, so, um, I would very much thankful to the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to talk about this important disease. I'm sure the adult gastroenterologists are, you know, troubled with many children and adolescents who are coming with this symptom and, and uh, without uh, knowing exactly what it is and how to handle this problem is always going to be very challenging. I'm still learning, I'm still in the learning curve of this enigmatic disease, but I would share some thoughts of, uh, you know, what we have learned over the years and how to look at it in a uh, different angle, right? To start with, this is what uh, a century and a bit ago, uh, a great physician, uh, pediatrician in UK said, I know of no symptom which can be more obscure in its causation than colicky abdominal pain in children. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would ask, after a century and a bit, uh, we are still have we, you know, added anything more to this? So as the lecture unfolds, you will understand and how we have moved forward. So in this lecture, I would uh, like to talk about what causes chronic abdominal symptoms, epidemiology and risk factors, pathophysiology, novel concept of bowel and psychological damage, what's new in evaluation, and futuristic view of management of children with chronic abdominal symptoms. So what causes abdominal pain? We all know, right? So a lot of many diseases can cause uh, chronic abdominal symptoms at any given time. This can be organic and non-organic as well. So when somebody comes with abdominal pain, we just don't know what is going on, right? However, when we embark on research in this area, Actually, it was my wife who started this, and uh, then when we start to look at it, with a large cohort of children, we had abdominal symptoms, and then we start to investigate them, and uh, try to find out what's going on in these children, what organic causes are there. So we did gamut of investigation on these children, and found that major, only 10% of them, right, roughly have a organic disease that can explain their symptoms. So after all, then we, we thought, what, what do they have then? So they have functional abdominal pain. That is what causes abdominal pain in the majority of children and adolescents. So what is functional abdominal pain? It's defined as variable combination of chronic abdominal symptoms predominated by abdominal pain that can be can, which can be explained cannot be explained by structural or biochemical abnormalities. So that is what this majority of these children do have. So what are the four functional abdominal pain disorders in children? I'm sure uh, the first two are very familiar to this audience, but we have two more. That is abdominal migraine and functional abdominal pain not otherwise specified. How common are they? In the world map drawn by Kodnick et al. in 2015 says it's about 13.5%. Now the map is more colorful actually, but we don't have the updated map. So most of the South Asian countries have completed their um, epidemiological studies. India has conducted recently a large epidemiological study. So in that epidemiological surveys, it's around 10%, 10 to 15% of all. The, there's a study from Nigeria as well to, to uh, uh, represent the African subcontinent. So basically, it's about 10%, around 10% of worldwide children are suffering from abdominal pain-related symptoms. So what's happening in Sri Lanka? Wherever you work, it's again same, around 10% of children uh, are suffering from uh, abdominal pain, uh, predominant functional GI disorders. These are our data that we have gathered over the years uh, in Sri Lanka in various parts of the country. So what are the risk factors for 
chronic abdominal pain. So this cartoon illustrated uh, well. I suppose this, this, we wrote this review to Nature Review Gastroenterology with uh, my, our collaborators in Netherlands. So we, we, we thought, uh, you know, early life events, psychological stresses, genetic predisposition, gastrointestinal infections, and motility disorders, and altered gut microbiome, and uh, mast cell degranulation, and uh, dis disorders of mast cells can contribute to uh, development of functional abdominal pain symptoms in children. When you look it into more details, right, there are some funny risk factors when, when it comes to adult gastroenterologists. You know, a, there are very clear studies showing that neonatal gastric suction increase uh, tendency to develop abdominal pain later in life. Actually, this was demonstrated in children and later proved in uh, animal studies as well. Then the neonatal uh, separation from mother and the neonate uh, due to neonatal illnesses or maternal illnesses predispose children to develop functional abdominal pain disorders later in life due to increased visceral hypersensitivity. And uh, children born to mothers with gestational diabetes, mellitus, pregnancy-induced hypertension have higher tendency to develop functional abdominal pain disorders. Ab admitting into special care baby units, also a predisposing factors. I'm sure this uh, August gathering can understand. Now, when you admitted to a, a neonate, to a neonatal intensive care or special care baby unit, they are subjected to many invasive procedures which are, are, are heighten their visceral sensitivity. So other events like, you know, undergoing umbilical hernia repair, surgery for pyloric stenosis also predispose children to develop functional abdominal pain disorders later in life. So the psychological aspect, if you take, you know, these are some of our uh, findings over the years. Uh, at the top one, uh, separation from the best friend, frequent punishment in school, failure in academic, uh, examination and admitted to hospital for another email, which look very trivial actually. But when you take it into the context, they predispose children to develop functional abdominal pain. And high stresses, uh, which was uh, shown in Japanese studies, and high worrying scores, which was shown in uh, Korean studies, are also predisposed children to develop functional abdominal pain. This is the only study that uh, we have shown the association between child maltreatment and functional abdominal pain disorders in children. I'm sure this uh, adult gastroenterologist, like you all know, the irritable bowel syndrome uh, is a well-known, uh, sorry, the child abuse, abuse as a child in, in early life is uh, a well-known risk factor for development of irritable bowel syndrome in adults. There are wealth of uh, uh, information conducted by, uh, this is uh, research conducted by Professor Ke Kelly and Professor Douglas Drossman from the US have shown very clearly the fMRI studies have done on adult has also shown when they were abused as children, their brain is not functioning uh, in a normal way and so they, they, they get their amygdala activation very early and they develop more functional abdominal pain disorders as adults. Now, this is the only uh, pediatric study in the world because this conducting this uh, study is not very easy to get the ethical clearance and so that. So this is what it is. So child abuse predisposes children to develop functional abdominal pain disorders later in life. And change in microbiome. Now, this cartoon is very interesting. If you carefully look uh, on the far side of the uh, screen, you can see the blue normal microbiome. When we were having right genetics, when we are breastfeeding, when we eat natural food and living with animals, we have a healthy microbiome. Now when we start to take antibiotics and other drugs and uh, you know start consuming a little bit of uh, junk food, the microbiome become unhealthy. And then if you continue this for over the few years, your microbiome is not unhealthy, ladies and gentlemen. They become absolutely pathogenic. They become pathologically oriented. 
So when you have this microbiome, you only need some of them seep into the submucosa to exert a very significant immunological and uh, chemical reactions. You can see all uh, inflammatory cascade get activated when they uh, seep into the uh, submucosa and set up something very similar to IBD, right? And, and, and this inflammatory cascade going on is no wonder these children develop abdominal pain due to secretion of all these toxic cytokines around. So the brain is not spared either. Look at, this is the normal brain with uh, prefrontal cortex, uh, anterior singular gyrid, and uh, the other parts, and it becomes pathologically oriented, right? With exposure to stresses, abuse, and early life events, and changing microbiome, cytokines, and all these causes, the brain also to pathologically oriented. So now your gut is pathologically oriented, your brain is not functioning very well, and there's a connection between the gut and brain called brain-gut axis, which is uh, nominated by the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis and the brain-gut axis. So all these predispose children to having chronic functional abdominal pain symptoms. So do you believe that can cause bowel damage? It's very similar to IBD. IBD causes the same cytokines come in, and I'm sure the research will show eventually this also causes significant amount of bowel damage. Low, there is a definitive low-grade inflammation in their submucosa. Right, their microbiome is pathologically oriented. They have motility abnormalities, right? They have change in their personality. They have sensitivities, seeing continuous firing of gut-brain axis and hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. All these causes brain damage as well as bowel damage. So in they are, so there no wonder one third of them ended up with you people because children, about 30% of children who have abdominal symptoms, chronic abdominal symptoms, will end up in adults with IBS or functional dyspepsia. So this is a news to you. Unless we do something here, you have a large population of children, uh, adults with adolescents and, and young adults with functional abdominal pain disorders in years to come. So how are we going to make a diagnosis of this interesting disease? So you do assess with a good history and examination and try to identify red flag signs. If the red flag signs are positive, you go on that pathway to find out whether there is any organic disorder for the If the red flag signs are negative, the most important point in the history is the bowel disorder, bowel, bowel habits, right? If they have abdominal pain with diarrhea, you know it is most likely IBSD. If the constipation is more predominant, it could be constipation predominant IBS. And if they are altering, it's IBSM, and there can be untypable IBS as well. It is if if the symptoms are predominantly in upper GI area, upper upper part of the abdomen, epigastric pain with early satiety and postprandial fullness, it's functional dyspepsia. Right? Abdominal migraine is somewhat misunderstood disorder, right? It's not the migraine that you get in the head, like, right? It's a disorder with severe abdominal pain in paroxysms with headaches, nausea, vomiting, and photobabia, pallo, and all the other uh, uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic autonomic functions, right? This doesn't occur every day. If, if you want to diagnose abdominal migraine, you only need two episodes, right, over the period of six months, right? And if the abdominal pain is predominant and if it doesn't fit into any other, other three functional categories, it's called functional abdominal pain, otherwise not specified. So those are the four categories that you see. So what can we do when you come across with one of these uh, uh, patients or adolescent with abdominal pain? So you, what, what we are, we, we think in the line of we need to exclude certain disorders at least to to make sure that he is not uh, 
suffering from a major disorder. I, I think probably the one of the most important things to exclude is um, IBD. So you do the blood counts and look at platelet counts, hemoglobin, and you do some inflammatory markers like CRP, SR, and urine microscopy to rule out urinary tract infection, which is one of the commonest in, in children. So then you do the stool microscopy as well in certain instances, right? And you can do fecal calprotectin, but unfortunately, this is a very good one, but unfortunately in our country, we don't get a, uh, our value, we just get it positive or negative, which doesn't mean a thing actually. You know, at least, uh, you know, I mean this, I don't have to say you people, it's need to be at least about 150 microgram per gram of stool to say whether we're having a IBD or not. So if it is less than 40, we can jolly well say it looks like um, uh, functional. So we need to press these uh, laboratories to do the, uh, you know, real values. Uh, we are just getting positive and negative. Depending on that, we can't decide on an endoscopy or not. So it's very important thing, but we are not getting the benefit of them doing it at the moment. Uh, well, would you all do a upper GI endoscopy on these fellows? <laughs> right, very interesting. When we, um, 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 I had my experience of doing upper GI endoscopy on this one. Uh, people with abdominal pain, sometimes I do, uh, right? Only thing I find is some degree of minor cell infiltration and all that. But that cannot explain the major symptoms that these children are having. And after doing the endoscopy, I am back to square one. Children do have same abdominal pain problems. Mother saying, no, you know, they're still having their pain. So, you know, it's, uh, you know we can't convince uh, them by doing ab uh, an upper GI endoscopy, say that your child is having no no problem. There is no problem, but still they would say, Doctor, my child is still having abdominal pain. So it's not the answer to all the question. Motility studies. We conduct a lot of motility studies, and and in Ragama when we were at Ragama, so we found what what we found basically was there are having abnormal motility in their upper GI tract. So the, their gastric emptying rate is abnormal in all four types, and their anteral motility index are abnormal. These are non-invasive tests done through an uh, uh, ultrasound method. So that's the easy one that we can do and convince people that they have a functional problem rather than an organic issue. So what can we do with these children? Um, please concentrate on concentrate on, on, on this uh, video a little bit, right? Well, is that playing? What I want you to s understand is their gut is in fire, right? Their brain is in fire, right? We just don't consider these things, right? They just can't handle, they don't complain uh, of abdominal pain simply because they have nothing else to do. So we need to find a solution to, to extinguish this fire, right? And make them, uh, 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 you know, symptoms free. Otherwise they would suffer a lot. So how can we do that? It's through a very careful assessment, ladies and gentlemen. So evaluate them very carefully, look at all the risk factors, and try to understand where we are standing with a individual patient. So if the central mechanisms, like if they had gone through an, a period of abuse, if they have a lot of psychological stress, anxiety, depression, an early life event, right, you need to address the brain as well as the gut. But addressing the brain is more, should be more predominant in your therapeutic approach, right? So you can use counseling, cognitive behavior therapy, some degree of meditation, hypnotherapy, antidepressant, those things should be more to children with more central mechanisms. So some people do have both central and peripheral mechanisms. So abuse, dysmotility, stress, abnormal microbiome, post-infectious IBS, by depression, so they can have combined sort of therapy with cognitive behavior therapy, promotility drugs, hypno, 
and probiotics. If the peripheral mechanisms are predominant, like post infectious, IBS, dysmotility, abnormal microbiome, dietary triggers, and immune mediated issues, so you can use a different set of drugs to treat them properly. So, what do we have in our armory as therapeutic interventions? So, let's look at the pharmacological interventions. So, recently the Montelocast has some efficacy. Domperidone, we conduct this trial, one of our PhD students. So we found Domperidone is effective in treating children with functional abdominal pain disorders. Then SSRI, Meborine, uh, Dutavarine, and those drugs are effective. I know you uh, adult gastroenterologists use amitriptyline for adults, and there are lubiprostone trials in adults, but they are not very effective in children at the moment. So we have, uh, pediatric, uh, pediatricians have conducted um, two or three trials about amitriptyline, you know, two uh, clear randomized control trials failed to show any therapeutic benefit. Third one is still in the pipeline, and um, it's, it show it's an open label, but uh, they show some efficacy, but due to open label nature, the disease, uh, the, the findings are questionable a little bit. So we don't have much actually in the current day. So the, what are the new drugs in the pipeline? Tandospirone, allocetron, remocetron, and enaclotide trials are going on in children with functional abdominal pain. The combined trials in Europe and US combined group is doing these trials. So the results will be out very soon. Whatever they found, ladies and gentlemen, what I believe is what I found. Pharmacological interventions are not very successful in controlling symptoms alone. You can't address all that, what I show you a few minutes ago, can't address all that with a, only with uh, pharmaceutical interventions. So what can you do then? These are effective. There are very good trials showing the effectivity of cognitive behavioral therapy, exposure-based cognitive behavioral therapy, guard-directed hypnotherapy, guided imagery, yoga, self-disclosure, and mindfulness-based therapy, which is an image, uh, emerging one, and, 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 and there's a plan to conduct a big trial uh, in the world. So these things are effective, uh, and there are some evidence that they are good enough to treat children with abdominal pain. Dietary interventions, people do a lot of dietary modifications, but are they effective? Only thing that recently found was to be effective was uh, if they have low fiber diet, optimize and maximize it to the uh, reasonable level, that would be a bit effective, but other dietary modifications have not shown to be very effective in these children. And then probiotics, uh, supposed to be a very good therapeutic intervention. There are trials in children, but they are, have their own problems. No one do you know, no two groups do trials to, with the similar uh, uh, probiotics. And sometimes we, when people do combined probiotic trials, you know, it's very difficult to interpret them. So lactobacillus reuteri, uh, you know, the three trials have shown to be beneficial and two inconclusive. Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG for IBS, uh, two trials show it was beneficial, but one trial was inconclusive. VSL3 hash is a combined done, and only one trial which shows some beneficial effects. Now, how can we uh, keep the brain gut axis quiet? There's an interesting way to stimulate the vagus nerve. This is a very uh, technical research conducted by the group of uh, researchers from Wisconsin, USA. So they stimulate the uh, vagus nerve through the percutaneous electrical nerve field stimulation so that the part of the brain gut axis can be keep quieter, right? So, you know, what are we doing generally? So we do the current management paradigm, which just goes up like explanation, we try some dietary modification, we try some, uh, you know, meborine and, uh, you know, rifeximine, tricyclic contributions, we just go on in the ladder, right? While we are, on the business as usual like this, we try various things and, you know, with minimum effects. 
we have problems here. The bowel get damaged, they get psychological consequences, there's a huge healthcare expenditure, their education is affected, their family's issues, and their health-related quality of life goes down. So, ladies and gentlemen, we need to do something. We need a paradigm shift for sure, right? What the paradigm shift that I'm suggesting is early aggressive therapy. We need to do something for these children. Just don't send them away saying it's all in the mind and all that approach has no future, right? So let's do something different, right? This is not there in any of the guidelines, but I thought this is what the way that I approach. If they have IBSC, I thought I, I would talk about IBS because this gathering would understand it better. So IBSC, if you have IBSC, just go, you know, just don't treat with, uh, you know, polyethylene glycol or some more. Just think, right? If they have a central effects, right? You need to address those parts, right? So we start with a motility agent and polyethylene glycol, a probiotic and hypnotherapy. Like you can make your combination depending on the situation of the child and then gradually come down slowly. Once the abdominal pain recedes, you can, if the constipation is still predominant, so you can treat with PEG for a while and then try to tail off the drug, right? Very similarly, if you have IBSD with a lot of peripheral or central mix side effects, so you can use rafiximin, probiotics, and to counteract central, you can try amitriptyline and, and, and gradually come down. So that's why approach for functional abdominal pain in children. Let me summarize, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, of what I told. FPD is a common problem across the world. Wherever you do research, you have functional abdominal pain. And risk factors are equally common, right? So there's no way that we're going to escape from functional abdominal pain. Without knowing functional abdominal pain, we just can't be a adult or pediatric gastroenterologist, especially in Sri Lanka where the pediatric gastroenterologists are not existing at the moment, right, as a subspecialty itself. So altered microbiome, visceral and central hypersensitivity play a pivotal role in the pathogenesis. And simple clinical evaluation provides the diagnosis most of the time and uncontrolled symptoms lead to bowel and psychological damage that you really have to remember. And early aggressive treatment to control symptoms is very important. Thank you very much for your patient listening.